Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Kristen Lambert. I work with Mercy Corps Agriculture Systems Technical Team, and I support the USAID-funded SCALE Award. So we're gonna be talking today about what agroecology looks like in practice, specifically exploring from a number of different perspectives what this approach offers as a pathway to resilient food systems. Uh, we'll be talking some about what we've done and what we know, as well as some of the gaps in our knowledge and the opportunities and barriers to scaling up. So Nisha, if you could do the next slide, please. So just a quick um, housekeeping note or two. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box. You'll see the icon at the bottom of your page. And I'd encourage you to use the space to share experiences, resources, and information with the other attendees. Um, you can also use that space to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties by private messaging the all panelists option. Um, you'll also see there's a Q&A function directly to the left of your chat icon. And I'd like to encourage you to use that option to flag any questions to the panelists. We wanna make sure that that doesn't get lost in all the information going back and forth in the chat. Uh, so please use the Q&A. And lastly, I just wanna note that we will be doing, uh, sending out a, a recording of the webinar along with a number of links and resources that you all might find relevant. Next slide. So before jumping into our conversation today, I just want to flag that this discussion is not a standalone webinar. It's actually a side session that's happening as part of the Borlaug International Symposium, or the World Food Prize. And the overarching theme this year is resilient global food systems. So there's a lot of side events happening like this one that are free, they're publicly accessible, so I'd encourage you all to, uh, to log on uh, to the website that you see at the bottom there and check it out if you're excited about this conversation and looking for other opportunities to stay engaged. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanna say a couple quick words about the SCALE Award, which I work on. SCALE is strengthening capacity in agriculture, livelihoods and environment. And it's a five-year award that's funded by USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Affairs. And SCALE is basically, it's a knowledge sharing, capacity strengthening, research and learning mechanism for partners working on BHA funded global food security programs. And our aim is to improve the impact, the sustainability and the scalability of BHA's activities specifically relating to agriculture, NRM, and alternative livelihoods in both emergency and development contexts. Um, so within, this, this, uh, within our work portfolio, resilient agriculture has, has been a real key feature. And so if you check out the FSN network, I think you'll find a number of resources, upcoming and past events talking about this, uh, this subject that might be of interest. So in terms of our agenda, we have 90 minutes here today and we're hoping to cram a lot in. So you can see, um, here's our plan in a nutshell. Um, we're going to first set the scene. Basically, why are we talking about agroecology? Why does it matter for global food systems? Next, we'll share some practical examples of how implementation is happening right now in a range of different contexts. And then we'll examine the evidence base for what works. What do we know about the impacts and what's missing? We'll also hear from some of our speakers who've been engaged in the private sector and entrepreneurial side. We'll share a bit about what opportunities look like for engagement from that end. And finally, we'll reflect on the hurdles to sustainability and scaling up in an open Q&A section. So please do use that Q&A box and ping us as questions come to mind. And finally, we wanna make sure that the conversation and the engagement continues beyond this one webinar. So we're going to tell you about some opportunities to join us as we close out the session so that we can explore some next steps for collaboration. Next slide. So to guide us through the conversation today, we have the team of experts that you see here representing a range of different agencies, 
geographic experiences and technical backgrounds. So the order in which you'll hear them, we have Dr. Andrea Mottram. Uh, she's my colleague at Mercy Corps and is the director of the SCALE Award. She has over 20 years of experiencing, experience designing and managing agricultural research and development programs across Africa and Asia on topics such as smallholder crop production and sustainable resource management. We also have Jan Morrow. He is the acting agriculture team lead in the Office of Technical and Pro Program Quality at USAID's new Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, the donor for SCALE. Jan provides technical support and policy guidance for programming and planning related to a range of issues, including agricultural production, mitigation, and food security. Next, we have Warren Brush, who has been working closely with the SCALE Award as a resilience design consultant. He's also an educator, a lecturer, and a, stor and a, and a storyteller. Um, he's worked for over 30 years in agroecological education and regenerative system design, and he's the co-founder of Quail, Scr Quail Springs Permaculture. We also have Thomas Cole, a resilience design consultant and another one of the key members of the expanded scale team. He's the co-founder of the NGO African Women Rising, which he'll be telling you a little bit more about shortly. And he's worked for over 25 years in sustainable agriculture with a focus on post-conflict recovery, agricultural extension, natural resource management, and food security. Next, we have Amanda Gant, uh, the Accelerator Manager for the Global Restoration Initiative at the World Resources Institute, uh, where she's improving and expanding WRI's Land Accelerator Program, which is a really exciting initiative and something she'll be sharing about shortly. Uh, previously, she was a small business lending officer to dozens of businesses in DC, and she's actually led startup camps and virtual mentorship programs uh, that have supported entrepreneurs across Africa, Eastern Europe, and Asia. Next, we have Samuel Rigu. He is an environmentally conscious agribusiness manager, a social entrepreneur, and an innovator. He founded Safi Organics in 2015, which is a company that uses technology to convert farmers' crop waste to high-yielding organic fertilizer. And then we have Looney Libis. Um, he's been a serial entrepreneur for over 25 years. Incredibly, he has founded six startups, including Fledge, which is a global network of company accelerators and seed funds that help entrepreneurs create impactful companies. And more recently, he started Africa Eats, um, a company with a diverse portfolio of African food and agricultural companies that are feeding millions of Africans through their network of thousands of smallholder farmers. And we also have Fer Dr. Fergus Sinclair. He's the leader of system science at ICRA, or the World Agroforestry Center, based in Kenya. So he leads the center's research into the contributions that trees can make to the productivity of farming systems and the lives of rural communities. So this has entailed a focus on soil and water productivity and understanding the factors of affecting farmer decisions about which trees they incorporate on their farms. Um, he's also project team leader for the UN Committee on World Food Security, high level panel of experts, and he's written extensively on agroecology. So that is our powerhouse um, panel for today. I'd like to thank you all for joining us and I think we're ready to get started with our conversation. So I'll turn over to you, Andrea, uh, to kick us off and help us set the scene. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Um, as Kristen mentioned, I'm Andrea Mottram, the Program Director for SCALE with Mercy Corps. I'm delighted to be here today with our panel of experts and I'm looking forward to some inspirational conversations that we're going to have over the next hour or so. Um, before we hand over to the panel, I wanted to just start with a short introduction on, on what we mean by food, food systems and how agroecology can begin to address food system challenges. Next slide, please, Anusha. 
As most of you know, food systems are very complex. They include all the processes and infrastructure involved in feeding a population, right from growing food all the way through to disposal of food and food-related items, which includes the inputs needed as well as the outputs generated at each of those steps along the process. The food system is also composed of subsystems, for example, farming, economic and social systems, and within those, there are further subsets of water, energy, financing systems, and so on. So there are so many different complex interconnected levels within the system. A sustainable food system is one that delivers food security and nutrition for everyone in a way that does not compromise the economic, the social, and the environmental base. And taking a food systems approach means that rather than tackling the outcomes of the, a broken food system, for example, malnutrition, we instead tackle the fundamental and the interconnected system itself, from production and distribution through to consumption and disposal. Next slide, please, Amisha. We live in incredibly turbulent times. Food systems are at a crossroads and global and local levels, we face multiple food system challenges. Today, we all know the global COVID pandemic is raging across the globe. It's highlighting how fragile food systems are. It's eroding human capital and it's fragmenting trade and supply linkages. And when these supply linkages are disrupted, the impacts, particularly on vulnerable households where we work, can be swift and severe and, full, and fuels malnutrition. At the same time, in our humanitarian development work, fragility is increasingly affecting our operating environment, from conflict to, to states where we work, to the countries that experience more nuanced and time-bound fragility. Um, and that's only going to increase as COVID continues. And probably most importantly, climate change is upon us and human impact is at its highest. We're seeing the doubling of a population since 1970 and doubling of urban areas since 1992. Next slide, please, Anisha. These challenges, as well as others, as we know, are having a huge impact on the environment, including a decline in natural ecosystems and forests. Soil degradation has reduced productivity of 23% of the land on Earth and biodiversity, and by that we mean the diversity within species, between species and of ecosystems, is declining faster than at any time in human history. Shocks and stresses are here, they're impacting agriculture everywhere from droughts to floods to seasonal changes to pests and disease. And at the same time, intensive farming systems are often contributing to these problems. They're exhausting the natural resources, focusing on short-term gains rather than long-term sustainability, which works best for land, wildlife and local communities. We therefore need an alternative food system that really is sustainable. Next slide, please, Anusha. Agroecology is the application of ecological, ecological concepts and principles in farming. And over recent years, it has expand, expanded in its scope. Originally, it focused on fields and farms and now really encompasses whole agriculture and food systems. So it now really represents a transdisciplinary field that includes all of these listed in the, in the slide, the ecological, the sociocultural, technological, economic and political dimensions of food systems. Next slide, please, Anisha. So rather than depleting natural resources, agroecological practices harness, maintain and enhance biological and ecological processes. You can just run through this list now, Anisha. Um, they reduce the need for purchase inputs, including fossil fuels and agrochemicals, and they create more diverse, resilient and productive ecosystems. Next slide, please, Anisha. But there's no definitive set of practices, nor clear boundaries between what is agroecological agro and what is not. Instead, agricultural practices can be classified along a spectrum to the extent which they rely on ecological processes as opposed to purchasing inputs, that they are e equitable, environmentally friendly and locally adapted and controlled, really important in the environment that we work in, and they adopt a systems approach rather than focusing on specific technologies. This dynamic approach allows for really context specific solutions, which are really important within the work that we do, because we work in so many different contexts. But at the same time, they provide challenges for program implementation as they're trying to co-develop the best solutions. Next slide, please, Anisha. So in our session today, we're going to explore the potential for agroecology to transform food systems. We're going to see some agroecological approaches in action at the farm level understand more about the evidence that we're taking and learn how we can engage with the private sector in ways that promote and work with agroecology rather than against it. And then we'll also touch on some of the challenges as we move forward.
So firstly, I've got great pleasure in introducing Jan Marai, who leads the agriculture team at USA Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. As Kristen mentioned, USAID funds the SCALE Award and much of the resilient agriculture and agroecological work that we do. And so I'm pleased to hand over to Jan. Thank you, Andrea. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to see so much interest in this topic um, and to be here virtually with you all today. As both Kristen and Andrea noted, uh, my name is Jan Morrow and I'm the acting agriculture team lead in the Office of Technical and Program Quality at USAID's newly formed Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, or BHA. As many of you may be aware, the new Bureau brings together the resources and expertise of what were USAID's Office of Food for Peace, FFP, and the Office of US Foreign Disaster Assistance, OFTA, creating one USAID Bureau. And it's the US government lead for global humanitarian assistance. We're confident that combining our humanitarian resources and capabilities will increase our influence and effectiveness and create a strong, cohesive platform for linking humanitarian and development assistance. In this period of change, our top priority will be to ensure the continuity of operations and to continue to maintain and improve the technical quality of the work that we carry out with you, our partners. In this regard, learning awards like SCALE continue to play an important role, not only in strengthening partners' capacity, but also in providing the space for exchanges like this one today to discuss critical challenges and explore promising approaches from a range of perspectives. For the communities in which BHA works, the trends that Andrea spoke about are undoubtedly familiar. The degradation of soil fertility, the loss of biodiversity, and the devastating damage caused by climate-related shocks and stresses have had profound impacts on the food security and livelihoods of families we work with, many of whom are also facing the effect of ongoing conflict and political instability. The emergence of COVID-19 this year has only heightened these vulnerabilities, leaving already fragile agriculture and food systems all the more weakened. Through our partners, USAID and other donors in our global community, have been adapting to these emergency needs for food assistance and support during this crisis. In addition to adapting existing programs to the COVID-19 pandemic, USAID and the US State Department have committed more than $1.6 billion in health, humanitarian, economic and development assistance specifically aimed at fighting the pandemic. We have also adapted guidance for our partners on how to best adapt their programming within existing agriculture and natural resources management related activities to ensure that they are COVID-19 appropriate and take into account relevant health guidance. In addition to meeting the immediate response needs to COVID-19 and pivoting our existing activities, we also have an opportunity to rethink our response priorities and practices and perhaps even build back better. With that in mind, this conversation on enhancing the resilience of our global food system through agroecological approaches is a particularly timely one to explore. While I suspect that some attending this session may have long histories working in agroecology, holistic programming in this area is still something rather new to our Bureau, though implementers have certainly integrated components of agroecology into their agriculture objectives. We will see some examples of BHA programs implementing these approaches in small ways, as we will hear in this session today. We can see the opportunities to expand these approaches to our fragile and emergency contexts as well. For instance, the opportunity to bring more gardens into refugee and IDP camps as a way to introduce fresh nutritious food. We can also see how, on a wider scale, these agroecological principles can help to tackle the challenges we see for agriculture contexts and for natural resource management. We encourage partners working in this space to continue to document what they're learning about implementation best practices, and particularly about the impacts as well as challenges. From USAID's perspective, and particularly the new Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, we are keen to see partners grow the evidence base on what works, and to better understand the impacts on critical indicators related to household food security, dietary diversity, nutritional status, and resilience. Conversations like this one, pulling together a diverse set of practitioners and researchers, is one promising step forward. So with that, thank you all for attending, 
and we look forward to the excellent presentations and to learning more with you all today. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks so much, Jan, and thanks, Andrea. Andrea, I think um, your presentation really laid out kind of the urgency and the appropriateness of the conversation that we're having today. And Jan, it's so great to hear how USAID is now thinking about the connections between agroecology and resilient food systems. So it just seems like a really timely conversation. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to you, Warren, uh, to help us jump into what does agroecology look like in practice and how is it being implemented in these humanitarian and development contexts? Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a good day to you all. And I'm honored to be here as a farmer, a scientist, an agricultural systems designer, and a father and a grandfather. Just like the woman you're seeing in this slide, her name is Denisa, who did a agroecology training with us last year in Tanzania. We all share a concern for the future of the world. And with agriculture covering over half of the habitable land on this planet, we as agricultural practitioners have not just an opportunity, but a responsibility and an obligation to ensure that our practices are achieving food and nutritional security for a growing population, while at the same time improving water quality, air quality, uh, eliminating degradation, and mitigating climate change. In both seeing and participating in agricultural and agroecological projects around the globe, I believe that those agricultural practices that are regenerative in nature and which takes responsibility for their external impacts are the only way forward. So let me share with you more about my experience in bringing agroecology into the humanitarian and development space. Uh, Nusha, if you could change the slide, please. So here, um, about over five years ago through a USAID TOPS award that was administered by Mercy Corps, we were gathered uh, as a group of different practitioners from different fields in the regenerative uh, practices space. And that included agroecology, agroforestry, holistic grazing management, permaculture, the soil food web, rainwater harvesting, food forestry, and also farmer managed natural regeneration. And we're brought together to help develop a design system for those different practices to be able to work in the unique operating environments that exist in the humanitarian and development space. And the thing that I found in common amongst all of those practices was the foundation of soil and water. And so if you could change the slide, please, that would be great. Um, and so at the very foundation of any agroecological system is a regenerative hydrology and a living soil food web. So looking at this picture, um, this is from a program that I did a training for, for agri government agricultural extension service in Soto, Ethiopia. And this is a farm that's feeding about 108 children at an orphanage. And they basically were given the worst land in that area, which was a eucalyptus forest at one point. And the ag extension agent said, nope, there's nothing we can do here. This land is too degraded. It's eroded. And there's too much allopathic uh, chemicals in the soil from the, from, the, um, from the trees. But within, by applying agroecology principles, of basically building the, the hydrological system and the soil first and thinking of it as a long-term investment, we were able to uh, develop a highly productive, stable growing system, as you see, within just three years. And even in the first month, we were able to get amaranth greens into the mouths of these young kids, even within a month. So we were producing right away, but also into the future. So so much of the story of agriculture over these last years has been about the disregard of natural processes and it has left a lot of massive degradation. So go ahead and go to the next slide, please. And so when you look at the picture on the left here, this is an interesting story from up in the hills uh, in, in the DR Congo and working with a BHA funded program. When we got there, these hills were incredibly denuded and this is up near the top of the hill and the farmer whose land this was, was broke because they had degraded their land 
so extensively. Um, starting about 12 years ago, they cut down all the forest that was up there and started an agricultural project that was a monocropping scheme that led to massive degradation. And so that degradation starting at the top of the hill started moving its way down and then quickly plumed into the lake and caused difficulties with the uh, with the fisheries as well. And so for us, we uh, started to reclaim that process by basically planting the rain and building the soil. Next slide, please. And so in the process of slowing, spreading, and sinking water into the land, we do these hand-built projects as well as projects that are more extensively uh, done with larger equipment, but most of the projects we're doing are with smallholder farmers doing simple processes like these bioswells that can actually help to bank the water. They reduce the erosion and the leaching of the landscape of all of its valuable nutrients as well as uh, the groundwater recharge. Um, next slide, please. So looking at how do we scale this up, we started uh, working with uh, the Mercy Corps group that is doing uh, out, it's a BHA funded program that's being administered by Mercy Corps and it's out in the Congo as well. And we're starting to work on watershed levels. And if you look at that bottom picture, you can see that there is a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different earthworks that have gone into this, this structures that have rebuilt the, the growing capacity of the farmers in that area. And so even with this, we're taking agroecology even further into the realm of infrastructure. So if you go to the next slide, please. We're working with uh, the Danish Refugee Council and we've basically have uh, developed um, programs to help protect infrastructure as well as to take advantage of the infrastructure that goes through communities like roads. And so here you can see we're taking road, ra road water runoff and the nutrients on the roads out into the farms. We're developing livestock ponds and all of the results have been very promising. Um, I feel that if you go to the next slide, if you look at um, the, the process of doing this by hand and then with some equipment, we have been able to change the hydrological story of this landscape in, this is in Nebi uh, near in Uganda, and we've been able to literally start to slow spread, sink that water into the soils for, for agricultural purposes. Next slide, please. And so here, just after one rain, we were able to not only stop the erosion of their, uh, of their landscapes that were taking away valuable nutrients, we were able to contribute to them by actually using the road as a process of, of, um, of rainwater harvesting. And it was able for us to actually hydrologically stabilize the landscape for better production, which leads to our end goal in agroecology, which is the next slide, please which is really to stabilize production for nutrition and income throughout the year. So this is something where we're looking at not just a, a monocrop one-time uh, uh, yield, but looking at how we can produce crops of biodiverse, uh, of much biodiversity in both perennial and annual form in a landscape, but to have the basis of soil and water to be able to be ensure that it's maintained for not just our own generations, but for future generations to come. So I'd like to hand this presentation over to Tom Cole, who will share more about the application of agroecology at the scale of the household. Tom? Great, thank you, Warren. Um, and a big thanks to, to everyone else for, for sharing already. Uh, through these presentations, we've seen the role of agroecology that, that it can play in helping to stabilize the ecology and productive capacity of landscapes across a range of areas. We're now going to talk about what that can look like in one of the more challenging and degrading contexts in which many of us work. And that's the scenario of mass displacement in camps for refugees and internally displaced. Next slide, please, Anusha. So the question is, you know, where are we right now in these, in these settings? We have an unprecedented level of global forced migration, which we many of us realize in 2020, there are 26 million refugees, 46 million IDPs, sort of the, bigger, the biggest numbers in history. And within these camps, uh, resources are stretched 
incredibly thin. Uh, oftentimes food aid is being cut. Funding shortfalls this year led to 30% reductions in the food aid basket across multiple refugee hosting countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. On top of that, you layer in the effects of COVID-19 and we're seeing poverty and hunger spiking in, in, in all of these areas. We've always known that refugees uh, will often sell their, their rations to get some sort of income. Um, but in 2020, I think the situation is a lot more stark. And against this all, as we've talked about, Jan has talked about and Warren and, and Andrea, we have, uh, it's a backdrop of shifting weather patterns, unreliable rainfall, greater demands on the environment, and essentially overall uh, greater land degradation. Next slide, please. So again, where are we? Within a camp setting, there's often very little land for refugees or IDPs. You can see in these, in these pictures here from uh, camps in northern Uganda and eastern Chad in Somalia. There's very limited water, especially in the dry season. And in the dry season, the, the areas around the camps extremely dry and parched. Uh, the predominant food security response over the several decades I've been working uh, in this sector is it's a lot of seeds and tools and, and inputs um, being given out. You have a lot of sap gardens, raised keyhole gardens. And when you look at it and you look at the, the impact on, in some of these areas, uh, you realize that there's not a lot of emphasis on long-term soil fertility or water. And here you have uh, this year, the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize Award to WFP, which is phenomenal. And I'd like to give kudos to our colleagues from WFP and all the local operating partners. But when a prize such as this goes to treating symptoms instead of tackling root causes, it begs the question, are our present systems and approaches up to the task? And I, I might say no, not necessarily. Next slide, please. So what's a way forward? And I think this, this whole set of presentations talking about agroecology, what is it we can learn from agroecology to help, to help stabilize the environment in a humanitarian setting? And we're just gonna put out one approach, uh, the permagarden household approach, which is a regenerative set of practices based on the permaculture design framework, biointensive techniques and agroecological principles. And it's a practical lens for humanitarian work. And it's the resilience design application that Warren Brush Warren, excuse me, was just speaking of, but it's localized to the household level. And we call this the whole compound approach. We're seeing the entire compound, even in a refugee camp, as it as has the potential as a giant multi-layered kitchen garden that maximizes food, nutrition, income, and ecological stability. It's a practical link between food security and natural resource management. And it focuses on identifying and using local resources, participatory approaches, soil fertility, water harvesting, crop diversity. And it, the emphasis is on learning the principles behind this before you actually start implementing activities. And we're already doing this, doing the permagardens through a range of BHA funded programs uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa, as well into, into Nepal, which we'll speak about in a moment. Next slide, please. So here's, um, here's a practical application of the permagarden approach in uh, Palabek refugee settlement in northern Uganda. Um, and the, the system here, and you can see in those photos there, that this is in a refugee camp, and the, the, we're designing a system to build soil fertility and capture water. And the emphasis on, is on stability, the stabilization of growing conditions around hydrology, soil biology. And the focus is on weekly harvests out of the garden, which means weekly income. And you're able to invest in savings and loan programs or use the money to pay to have their food aid, uh, the, the grain to have it milled or transported. Uh, next, season, next slide, please. 
So here in this image, this is the dry season in Palabec Camp. And uh, most food aid or sort of kitchen garden programs are not really focusing on how, how are you banking the water? How are you enabling uh, you know, a growing of crops to be able to harvest food well into the dry season? And in this context and in this approach, there's multiple combinations of strategies to help protect um, against the hot sun, against the winds, and to help protect sort of nutritional status. Next slide, please. So this next one, it's a little bit more extreme conditions in Dalo, uh, Somali, and IDP camp. Here was a garden, uh, a perma garden that was developed. This is a demo garden. And over the two weeks we we're there is daily temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you can see in this, not only within a few days did we have germination, but within five weeks, there's sort of a flourishing, uh, really uh, in, you know, intense um, garden there full of you know, six, seven, eight different kinds of foodstuffs. And this, is, this was us working with the Somalia team of the Danish Refugee Council. Next slide, please. There we go. So we want to talk about impact. And I know that's a big part of what we're here talking about today. And I see two sizable shortfalls in, in this space. One is the lack of data and evidence, both in the humanitarian space, in terms of humanitarian interventions, and a lack of data and evidence on the practical end of agroecology. And right now, there's several impact studies on permagardens out there, which are available. One is a USAID-funded program in Nepal, which established a very strong link, linkage to improve nutrition. And then there's a, a participatory impact assessment done by African Women Rising in Palabek. And I just want to highlight some of those results there. And this is, this is in a refugee camp setting. And those who were in the program, the primary dry season income for camp residents in the program was through harvesting from their perma garden. There's an increase in food consumption. There's a decrease, decreased reliance on WFP rations, as well as um, steady improvements in household nutrition. So I want to sort of leave us there with some of those questions, some of those practical applications and sort of seeing where we go. And I'm, I'm going to leave that to my colleagues. So thanks for joining with us on in this discussion. Kristen. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tom. And thanks so much, Warren, as well. I think find it really inspirational to see both what's possible at a large watershed scale, as well as what's possible under more extreme conditions and on these small spaces. So thanks for, thanks for sharing, thanks for the great visuals and kind of opening us up to what's already happening here. Uh, Tom, you also, you mentioned um, the research to date and, and some of the gaps that we have. And I wanna hand over to Dr. Fergus and Claire from ICRAF to talk a little bit more about the evidence base that we have on the impacts of agroecology. So over to you, Fergus. Hello there. So uh, I'm delighted to be able to uh, talk a little bit about um, what we know uh, about impacts of agroecology. Next slide. Uh, and the next one. So I, I was involved last year in two major reports. One um, was the uh, HLPE report on agroecology and other innovations. Um, and there's a huge amount uh, of information in there, an assessment of uh, knowledge. And from that, we can see that uh, there's evidence that agroecology can be as or more productive and more profitable than alternatives in some contexts. But that's often not why people adopt it. There are often lots of other reasons like health benefits, um, not uh, uh, um, degrading the environment, so on and so forth, that, that, that are more important at a particular time. And also, uh, this information doesn't help us to understand why and where different agroecological practices perform well. And as we've heard, right from all the speakers mentioned principles. And the thing about generic agroecological principles is when you apply them locally, 
using the central um, uh, principle of co-creation of knowledge with uh, farmers, then you end up with a diversity of practice because uh, they're locally adapted. So understanding uh, how options play out in relation to context becomes incredibly important. The second uh, report was for the Global Commission on Adaptation, and that was looking specifically at the extent to which uh, agroecological practices um, can help adapt to uh, climate change. And again, there's a plethora of information about individual practices um, being able to address specific uh, climate change effects. And there's some examples uh, on the screen there, contra hedgerows to reduce soil erosion caused by more, caused by more intensive rainfall, shade trees mitigating higher temperatures, um, and landscape level tree cover uh, improving nutritional benefits through increasing diversity of diets of women and children and uh, groundwater research. Really good evidence on that um, with actually quite solid uh, scientifically valid relationships between, uh, um, in that case, tree cover and, and, and those outcomes. So overall, there's enough evidence to show that, that practices can address uh, uh, climate change effects, but often the largest contribution that agroecology agro makes, and I really like the fact that Thomas mentioned the whole compound, because it's whole systems that matter. And farmers generally have a livelihood system. It's not just the, the, the agriculture that they're doing, but they've got lots of other things going on. And it's really important that the managing the interactions, the synergies uh, amongst components at the scale of the livelihood becomes uh, absolutely uh, uh, important. <clears throat> so we do not have robust evidence of the cost effectiveness of how different agroecological practices vis-a-vis -vis alternatives um, um, uh, impact uh, on uh, both productivity and resilience. Next slide. Now, so the information that we have, and there's lots of it, relates to some contexts. And also it tends to come from proponents of agroecology. So many of you will be familiar with, with the famous names, Jules Pretty, uh, Olivia Duchuta, um, um, and, and, and many others um, who have looked at particular cases where uh, agroecology and, and various types of sustainable intensification do better than monocultural alternatives. And uh, where they've tried to pull this information together, they come up with um, more cases in, from their sets uh, of cases that they've looked at that are um, positive for, for agroecology uh, rather than negative. And I'm going to mention, thanks to Matthias Geck, who, who I, I see is, is, is on the call from BioVision. I've got a couple of slides on some very recent reports from BioVision uh, coming up later that have some very recent data. Next, please. But this evidence is often very contested. So one of the most difficult things in uh, writing the GCA report was knee-jerk reactions from scientists reviewing the uh, work that we'd done because they assumed that agroecology was not very scientific. They saw it more in the social movement context and uh, they basically didn't look at the evidence but were very critical. Uh, and, and basically were not reading clearly and, and carefully what was there and what wasn't there. And then there's a question of what is evidence? So how do we rate the experience of uh, farmers, of social movements, of how things are spreading in a particular context against established science? How important is it to do a randomized controlled trial in order to try to uh, define uh, a, a particular level of impact, which may be extremely difficult to do because you tend to narrow things down when you want to make a precise measurement. But if what you're trying to do uh, uh, is, is a broad holistic uh, um, impact, then it, it's more difficult. So this uh, is, is an example from Andhra Pradesh in India, where the 
um, uh, concept. It was originally called zero budget natural farming, now Andhra Pradesh community uh, based natural farming. And it's had a real tension between established science and um, the social movement uh, in, in, in India and, and farmers who are practicing natural farming. When we managed to get beyond that by getting scientists and practitioners, uh, proponents uh, into a room, we actually found a lot of connectivity between what people believed in that was culturally uh, relevant and sensitive to them about why natural farming was important. And it was all around how um, uh, they were uh, 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 encouraging microbial uh, diversity and activity uh, in, in the soil. And we could map out what the hypothesis was, both from farmers, from, from proponents and from scientists. And then we were able to really discuss, providing we had rules of the game, that people respected each other and didn't poo-poo uh, the other person. Next slide, please. So one of the reasons that there's much less evidence about agroecology than, than many of the old monocultural type alternatives is because there's much less money that goes into looking at them. And this is from uh, the Biovision Money Flows report that they did with um, uh, uh, IPES Food. And you can see that in general, there's between three and 15% from Bill Gates to uh, USDA, of uh, funding uh, that, that is uh, going to agroecology versus uh, 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 non-agroecological uh, options. The outlier is, is uh, the Swiss Research for Development, where you've got a sort of 50-50 alternative. Now, what are the prospects of getting um, that up to 50-50 uh, across the board? Well, we'll need to be working very hard. Next slide. And that's one of the reasons that we set up a transformative partnership platform on agroecological approaches to building resilience of livelihoods and landscapes to try to plug some of these key evidence gaps. Uh, the first of which was evidencing socioeconomic viability and understanding adoption decisions, including impacts on labor, including uh, the reasons why people decide to adopt. Next, please. So what the TPP does is it addresses knowledge uh, uh, or implement, uh, 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 implementation gaps um, and it's demand driven. So you need to look at that previous slide from the, the inside out. You've got a series of engagement landscapes where national partners, farmers organizations, civil society are engaged and that's what drives the agenda. You've got collective formulation of the research question and, and, and building common methodologies. You've got research project implementation across a range of contexts so that you can understand what works where and, and, and for whom and how contexts um, uh, affect the appropriateness of different ways of doing things. And then uh, synthesizing and generalizing across those contexts um, and across the issues. And of course, advocacy, uh, um, publication, communication, through high profile events with decision makers and, and, and really developing this effective science policy interface that breaks down those barriers between social movements and science. Next, please. And here are the 13 principles from the HLP report against uh, Gleesman's five levels of agroecological transition with co-creation right at the center. And just to, to, to say that these principles um, um, uh, are very much complementary to the FAO elements, um, but they're a little bit more explicit and therefore better for characterization and analysis. Whereas the FAO elements are fantastic for discussing with uh, partners and, and identifying entry points. Next slide. And one, issue that we found as we started exploring socioeconomic um, and a common methodology for looking at it across Africa um, is that Gleesman's transition levels don't really work for many farmers in sub-Saharan Africa because they're not moving from a sort of green revolution context as in Andhra Pradesh where one of the key motivations is to get out of debt 
<laughs> rather than uh, anything else. Um, um, whereas in sub-Saharan Africa, people are, a lot of people are not using very many inputs at all. So the first uh, rung on the ladder is not about input reduction, it's actually about agroecological intensification, finding pathways to uh, greater uh, productivity that are in harmony with nature. And it's all about which uh, things we are intensifying, knowledge and labor in, in, in agroecology versus capital, uh, often in monocultural systems. Next, please. Now, when we bring in uh, the whole food system, we, we got the, the people coming in there, we've moved on to the next one, but, but once you bring people into the picture, the consumption patterns, then of course it gets more complex. So a critical issue is what are the metrics that we're using to, to judge the performance, uh, not just of agroecology, but of agriculture in general, because unless agricultural performance um, is uh, judged on a, a, a level playing field, then uh, agroecology approaches don't uh, come out. And there are basically different scales at which you need to do that. There's the field level practices, which is where most of the attention has been. But the problem is that in general, we don't have metrics that relate to the people who are doing the practice. Women may have a different performance measure than men. Um, uh, and now we're getting uh, um, IT techniques, which if they're used appropriately, can empower people to be evaluating uh, what happens across a, a, a wide range of contexts. At the farm level, we've got the whole factor productivity and resilience of livelihoods. At the landscape level, of course, a whole lot of ecosystem services come in. They're impacted by how we change uh, land use, and we need to then weight them in relation to the uh, social value uh, that's seen in terms of trade-offs and synergies amongst them. And then finally, at the whole food system scale, we've got to bring the consumption pattern in. So we need some sort of footprint type measure. Ecological footprint at the moment doesn't do it because it doesn't take into account how degradative or regenerative production is. Next slide. So this is a slide from uh, BioVision. And, and it's looking at the, um, uh, the, the report that they did with FAO. And it's, it, the, the, the first element here is a meta-analysis, um, and it does show solid evidence that um, agroecology can um, um, uh, build resilience. And that's uh, around principles of agroecology correlating with re resilience indicators and improved soil health biodiversity and uh, diversification contributing to resilience with added mitigation co-benefits through increased uh, soil organic matter. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, in, in terms of uh, the work that this uh, uh, report did, they looked in detail at two case studies, one in Senegal and one in Kenya. And the thing I really want to point out here is that in looking at resilience they have 13 indicators so we've already got a complex space once we're starting to try to look at how uh, agroecological performance runs out and you can see in Senegal that three out of the, the 13 resilience indicators were uh, higher for agroecology than, than um, non-agroecological alternatives. The sample sizes were uh, a, a bit less than 50 farmers in, in, in each case across uh, a couple of um, ecological zones. Next slide. In Kenya, a different situation, seven out of the 13 were significantly uh, uh, higher for agroecology as opposed to uh, the control alternative. And next slide, please. Uh, and you can see that these were different. So we've got our option by context space playing out. Things are different in Kenya and Senegal, as we might expect, some similarities, but some differences. Um, and we can see how the different indicators were uh, showing uh, a significant improvement as a result of adoption of agroecology. Next slide. And I want to end by trying to bring these aspects together because there's a huge interaction between uh, the evidence gaps, the implementation gaps, and taking action that will actually lead to widespread uh, adoption. So 
um, essentially, there are three critical areas. Creating a level playing field so that agroecology can have a, a, as much of a chance as, as other options. And there are lots of lock-ins that prevent that happening. Market failures obviously being critical. If you subsidize inorganic fertilizer or you've got legislation that makes it difficult for farmers to benefit from trees, it's really difficult for those things to work. We've got uh, maladaptive policies. We've got um, um, uh, the uh, need for an evidence base that policymakers can use in order to drive policy in an appropriate direction. We need to embrace complexity and that's one of the difficulties because you need to, you know, complexity doesn't have to be complicated. And it's really important that we can get across um, simple ways of dealing and harnessing complexity by addressing options by context interactions. And there are now a number of approaches to doing that with farmers um, and tools that help us to do it using plan comparisons. We need to foster co-learning and horizontal knowledge exchange from farmer to farmer. And those very much go together. Uh, with farmers evaluating their own perf the performance of, of options in their own terms and connecting the social movements and science. And finally, we need to enable integration, both horizontally across sectors and vertically across scales. There's virtually no social capital or policy instruments or processes that operate at the local landscape scale, say 10 to uh, 1,000 square kilometres, at which um, the ecosystem services that really matter begin to be manifest and, and, and we can manage them. Next slide. Just some resources which I'm sure uh, can be made available to you um, as things go on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fergus. That, that was really a fantastic overview and I appreciate how you were able to synthesize so much about the state of um, our knowledge and the gaps in 15 minutes. So no easy feat. Um, thank you for that. Now I want to turn to, to a discussion on how do we scale up these solutions? Because we know that transforming our food system is definitely going to take reaching scale. And as a piece of that, we're going to require the buy-in, the active support of the private sector and entrepreneurial minds. So I want to turn over to Amanda Gant um, from World Resources Institute to share a little bit about what they're doing, um, as well as to some of the colleagues that she's working with on some exciting initiatives. Over to you, Amanda. Amanda, looks like you're on mute right now. As always happens, right? I think I've got control of the screen here, but I'm not sure. So let me start by just sharing a story. Uh, Ferguson, uh, Dr. Ferguson Clare mentioned what are the reasons that people are turning to agroecology. Uh, and we have a, you know, many reasons. We have many people who are turning to that. Uh, we've had over 900 applicants to our accelerator program since we started in 2018. Um, one story I want to share today is about Francesca from, from Kenya. Uh, she grew up on a farm. Uh, I think she had six or seven siblings. Everybody was fantastic. They were growing coffee. Uh, all the children uh, ended up going to universities and actually ending up working in different cities around Kenya. One day Francesca received a call from her mom and said, hey Francesca, can you uh, help me with a, you know, a little bit of finances. And uh, she said, well, why? Uh, the coffee you know, isn't really doing that well. And Francesca went back home and saw that the coffee production, the yield had gone down to like 20% of what it used to be. And she looked around and all the other farmers were facing the same thing. And she said, we can't have this be a problem. So what Francesca started was actually a company to try and figure out how to get coffee yields back to where they had been. And uh, she formed a, uh, organic fertilizer company and she joined the land accelerator and so what we're seeing are a lot of companies choosing to do things that are sustainable because they're solving problems that are happening in their neighborhoods uh, in their communities and we're seeing people uh, so build companies uh, to address problems such as desertification soil infertility erosion um, and they're doing this through companies that could be doing many things such as agroforestry 
or organic farming, use of biomass and encouraging more production of bamboo, uh, non-timber for forest project, uh, non-timber forest products to avoid deforestation. So the land accelerator exists to help these companies um, come together and access a community to scale. So I am, oh yeah, great. I think it looks like it works. Uh, so the land accelerator and, and companies that are working in land restoration uh, face a major finance gap as was said before. And we are bringing people together with a partnership. Uh, later today, we'll be hearing from Looney Levis, who's the founder of Fledge. Uh, has been working with the Land Accelerator in Africa for the past two to three years to bring together an accelerator. Uh, we've worked with 26 companies so far in Africa that have engaged over 5,500, I'm sorry, 55,000 smallholder farmers in their restorative uh, activities. And this year we've just begun working with 15 South Asian companies uh, that have planted almost half a million trees in the past 12 months and working with over 66,000 smallholder farmers. So we can see that companies are a, a, a sustainable, financially sustainable way to grow, to grow uh, impact. The Land Accelerator brings together people uh, to learn about topics such as this one throughout the year and to practice, uh, to practice their, deliverable, their deliverables that they can bring to the community to get more people on board with what they're doing uh, to build their impact. So for instance, we work to get, we work to build the network of these entrepreneurs around uh, investors and partners so that they can grow. Uh, we're gonna hear from one of the participants in our program today, Samuel Rigu, who's built up an amazing decentralized uh, fertilizer company, as well as from Looney Libes, who's one of our trainers. Uh, and we'll also be sharing at the end of this presentation a way for people to get involved, people on this call. Uh, we'll have a survey after this whole webinar. Uh, we're looking for folks to be mentors, and we're also looking for uh, research partnerships. Each of these companies that I spoke about today can really benefit from having external research to prove uh, their kind of impact that they're having. And we'd be really happy to discuss ways that anybody here on this call who's interested in research can partner with any one of these companies to develop a nice research project. And that can be students and institutional resources. So with that, I want to turn it over to Samuel Rigu. Oops, we're going to skip through the rest of these slides. Samuel, can you unmute yourself and get ready to share about your company? Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Great. Um, So I'm, One afternoon. Uh, sorry. So Anusha, One you should be able to uh, change the slides now and go ahead, stop, um, Samuel. Okay. okay. One afternoon with my grandmother in the field, she said words I'll never forget. Son, 20 years ago, we were harvesting double of what we harvested today. I'm afraid in future, you'll have no food from this land to feed your children. And it turns out farmers in Africa pay two to five times the world fertilizer prices. What is worse is that these farmers can only afford the cheapest of these synthetic fertilizers that in the long, in the long run may lead to degradation of soils, leading to reduced yields, making them food insecure. This is unacceptable. Next slide, please. I'm Samuel Rigu, the co-founder of Safi Organics, and we use technology designed together with MIT to decentralize and small-scale fertilizer production process. We do this through five steps. Step one is where farmers correct their crop residues. They use our technology to convert that into uh, fertilizer base through a terrification process. Then they grind and we give them a special nutrient mix to add to the substrate, having a complete fertilizer, which they use much of it and then they sell the excess to us. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 is a reality and we have seen 
interruption in the fertilizer supply chain. However, because our production is happening locally and in the local villages, we have seen that the farmers are more resilient and they have a, a more sustainable fertilizer supply. Next slide, please. Looking at the competitive landscape, compared to the uh, status quo, which is the normal fertilizer, synthetic fertilizers, we are uh, 4,000 cheaper to set up uh, our facility. Well, compared to composting, which happens in local villages, our conversion time is 100 times faster. But that is not what really sets us apart. Our technology allows us to produce fertilizer that is soil specific to, this, uh, to the African soils. So that is what is really giving the farmers the advantage that they see after using our product that they can increase their yields by up to 30%. Next slide, please. So how do we make money? So currently, we make much of our money through the sale of fertilizer. So we make a 40% gross uh, margin while selling through the aggregators and the local distributors. However, in the medium term, we'll be charging the farmers on pattern usage of our technology. While in the, me uh, in the medium to long term, we do anticipate, currently we have a production facility in Moya doing about three tons in a day. Uh, we expect to set up similar uh, production facilities within the local villages and we'll be charging a 7% uh, revenue in terms of franchise. Well, in the very long term, because our product has the potential of sequestering 1.7 tons of CO2 for every acre of land it is used, we can consider carbon credit as a source of revenue. Next slide, please. Our target market is the smallholder farmers, just like Mr. Kibushi, whom we reach through his uh, farmer cooperative. He owns one acre of land, and his biggest fear is whether he'll be in a position to provide food for his children. In the last three seasons from using our fertilizer, Mr. Kibushi income increased by 50%. And this was enough to take two of his children to school. And this is the kind of impact we want to make to 3 million farmers first here in Kenya and a potential 240 million farmers globally who are growing at 2.9% per year. Next slide. To date, in Kenya, we are serving 4,000 farmers uh, with a team of about 30 laborers. We have been in a position to create job, uh, job valued at 800,000 US dollars. Farmers income increase of $600,000 and sequestered 2,700 tons of waste uh, in the last one year, as well as 6,000 uh, 6, tons of CO2 removed from uh, the and, uh, environment. Now, all these have been made possible in key collaboration with our partners, and we are also looking for partners such as uh, Brown University, who we are partnering in research to help us uh, document scientifically our impact. Next slide, please. We are keen to growing Safi Organics. And in the next uh, few years, we look at expanding beyond what we have in Moya. So by next year, we expect to go to three regions. And by the end of the year, we expect to start our trials in Tanzania. However, currently we are starting our, we are working on partnership with Nespresso as well as OCP uh, to see if we can uh, partner together to become development, uh, to become our expansion partners. So today we are seeking 750,000 US dollars to enable us expand to those four regions as well as partners who we can work together with 
to enable us grow our impact from the current 4,000 to at least uh, 3 million here in Kenya. So join us today and you will be part of helping restore soils and feed the world. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel. Um, it's, it's really a, an exciting story to tell and I appreciate you sharing your business journey with us um, and particularly the impressive impact data that you were able to share with us. So congratulations. Um, Lenny, I, I wanna turn over to you now. Um, and Anusha, if you could advance to the next, please. Thank you. All right, thanks, Kristen. All right, uh, it's been a, a great hour and 15 minutes so far, uh, hearing all about how these techniques help farmers. Uh, I'm gonna take it from a different angle. So this is my bio slide. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been building companies for almost 30 years. Uh, and the first 20 years, it's not to scale here, the first 20 years of my career was in tech. And the last eight has been in what I call the world of social good. Uh, or impact, or, or however you want to talk about this. Uh, and the primary tool there is Fledge. And so next slide. Uh, Fledge is a global network of impact-focused accelerators. So we took the best practices from the tech world, how to run a two or three month program, uh, how to help uh, entrepreneurs like Sam and others from all over the world. Uh, and we've grown this into a network where we've run 16 programs now, and uh, actually it's 17 with the, uh, South Africa, South Asian uh, Land Accelerator. So 17 programs in four continents. Uh, and we'll just keep growing this with, with more and more organizations that wanna help companies that, that do good in the world. Next slide. Uh, our latest effort though, in terms of agroecology is Africa Eats. So what we did is we took 27 of our graduates, all native African companies, 10 countries in Africa, uh, working with something like 33,000 farmers today. Uh, so these are companies that are tackling hunger and poverty, uh, and we're tackling funding. Uh, and we've wrapped them in a holding company. We've turned them into, we turn, we've changed them from 27 companies into, into one larger company that works together, but a minority stakeholder in each of the 27 companies. So it's not a conglomerate, it's an investment holding company. And the reason we've done that is a few, a few different things. But first and foremost, when we, when we talk agroecology or restorative agriculture or any of these big ideas, um, often what we see and what we heard about for an hour are all these projects at the level of the farm, one at a time, uh, and there are hundreds of millions of farms in Africa. Uh, and if those projects succeed, more food gets grown, but not necessarily more food gets eaten or sold. So we're taking a different tack at this. We're taking a pull version of, of how to make change uh, on the continent of Africa and elsewhere in the world. And the pull model is just using capitalism. So we're investors. We've invested in 27 companies. None of these 27 companies are themselves farmers. None of them uh, are uh, owning land that they then farm. They all instead work with smallholder farmers. These are the aggregators. These companies are the aggregators and the processors and the distributors of the food. And when they succeed, as, as they succeed and grow, then they pull the demand from the farmers and they pull demand from more and more farmers. Uh, our network of farmers is growing like 89% per year. Uh, and the farmers then will make the changes that these companies are asking for. And they're asking for organic and, uh, and good, good land practices because it's way easier to teach a farmer once you have them in the network how to do agroecology uh, practices than to go find another farmer. So uh, almost every one of our companies are doing organic practices without the organic certification. They're doing uh, the, best, the best practices they, they know of uh, to grow the best food possible. Uh, and it's all because these 27 companies are able to sell that food uh, in bulk, and generally what we're seeing is way more demand uh, than we're able to supply. Right? We're, we're hung up on the capital flow to grow these companies. And that's what we're seeing in general in Africa and the rest of the emerging markets is a huge number of great companies with great ideas 
whether they are uh, uh, fertilizer or chickens or fish or maize processing or honey uh, or um, some amazing little business models for growing, uh, growing products in distributed manners uh, or solving the post-harvest food, food problem uh, with innovative techniques. Uh, that's all within the system here. Uh, but they're able to then uh, pull those changes out of the market uh, by doing that, and they're, we're able to do that by investing in them. So next slide. The other thing we're doing with Africa Eats and Pioneering is not just doing this as an investment fund. So one thing that's vastly different between this new company and everything we've seen before is that everyone else out there is doing it one company at a time, and they're all saying, and we're all, we're all doing a little bit of help for each of these companies. But what Africa Eats is pioneering is, is connecting these companies together. So when we run the land accelerator or we run a fledge program, we get a bunch of entrepreneurs in a room together for weeks or months, uh, and they learn from each other. And it's amazing, and it's great. And they'll, they'll you know, get on a WhatsApp group afterwards, and they'll share a, li a little bit. But what we're doing at Africa Eats is one step beyond that. We've in fact assigned each entrepreneur to two boards. And so the boards of these 27 companies are now made up of entrepreneurs. And we're, we're the ones picking who's on whose board in order to help uh, foster the sharing of information as quickly as possible. And we're gonna rotate these boards every year. This is a new company. And so come 2021, everyone shifts over to a new board keeps one existing one. And so over time, these, these entrepreneurs are helping each other. They're, they're running each other's companies uh, from the board level. And from that, we're sharing knowledge across the, the continent. We're sharing knowledge in how to grow companies. We're sharing knowledge in how to work with farmers. And we're making a more resilient system at the level of aggregator, processor, distributor, and service provider. Right, I think I got one more slide. Oh, no. And that's, that's it on uh, how we do what we do. Uh, and again, we're seeing thousands of companies that apply into Fledge to be part of the system. Uh, and this is our uh, mid-pandemic solution on how to, get, how to make it work faster. Uh, and if you're looking for, for ways, uh, more information on any of this, I've stuck it in the chat channel. Uh, so fledge.co for information on the accelerator, africaeats.com for the holding company. Uh, and my blog is up there as well. That's great. Thanks so much, Looney. Um, really exciting stuff. And, and it struck me how I think what you're talking about kind of loops back to the, to the points that Andrea raised, that transforming food systems is really something that needs to be addressed at all levels. And I think that came out clear in your presentation as well. Yes. And I'm not saying we don't need to do the work with the farmers. I'm saying that work is so much more efficient when, uh, when they're production yields go up, when their outputs rise, their incomes rise because there's a sales channel to, to get that food to market. Absolutely. Well, I think from here, I know we're getting in a lot of great questions. So I think we can go ahead and uh, exit out of the slide deck now and have everyone up, um, our panelists now for a bit of Q and A. As it always seems to turn out, we're going to be a bit squeezed for time here but we'll look for opportunities to continue to engage with our attendees beyond this. Um, I wanted to just start with a, with a great question that came, up, came from Carl Wall um, at Concern Worldwide. And I think it's one that um, will probably strike all of our panelists in some way. Uh, so what Carl's raised is that this definition of agroecology that we're talking about in many ways seems to uh, suggest um, it's basically an expanded air of older organic farming systems, um, permaculture, for instance. And this puts it at odds sometimes with the national agriculture development plans and policies in many countries. Um, and I, I think we've even heard in these conversations the, um, the notion sometimes as modernity, as um, modern farming, as being driven by agrochemicals. And I'm curious to hear from this group how you might have felt that tension within your own work between promoting agroecological practices and perhaps some entrenched ideas about what modern farming should look like. And if you have any practices or techniques that you think have been successful 
and changing that mindset and encouraging adoption. So if this is something, um, if you'd like to, to weigh in here, just take yourself off mute and we can start the discussion. Can I, can I dive in? Um, I, I think it's really important. Uh, 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 the political economy of um, uh, agriculture is, is really significant. And obviously if we carry on with a business as usual agriculture that is in many uh, national development plans at the moment, then uh, there's going to be a, a real problem because uh, agriculture in that form is causing um, a, a lot of the global problems as Andrea <laughs> you know, showed at the beginning. So it's actually imperative to study that political ecology and to get beyond it um, if there's going to be a transformation. And I noticed there was another question that Krista uh, Marika asked us, which is, you know, w w was also, around, you know, is agroecology anti-technology? Well, it's not anti-technology, it's not anti-science, and it's not anti-business, as in fact we've seen from the presentations um, um, here. It's a question of how do you do your science? You know, do you do it with farmers in a transdisciplinary way, solving problems, or do you have a, 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 a big difference? Do, you know, how are your businesses set up, as we just saw from, from Looney? Are they, um, um, you know, very large uh, uh, centralised corporate uh, uh, activities, or, or, or are they uh, more locally uh, and, and promoting a, a circular economy? And uh, uh, um, in, in terms of technology, is the technology empowering people to uh, practice regenerative agriculture, or is it in fact making it more difficult? And so it, it's a matter of uh, how. There's a very interesting uh, Niti Aayog, which is a think tank for the Indian government. I put it in the resources at the end of the slide. They recently had a webinar um, where uh, there, it's the sort of run by the, 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 the prime minister, the Minister of Agriculture came up and citing the HLP report saying they want to go down a line of agroecological natural farming, but to do it in a modern way, because that is addressing the key challenges of today in, 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 in a modern way. So I think it's absolutely critical that it is not seen as a Luddite um, um, uh, formulation at all, but using technology for uh, the purposes and to empower people rather than to disempower them. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for raising those points, Fergus. And I'd be curious to hear from you, Samuel, on how you've experienced this. Um, what have your strategies been in encouraging farmers to uptake the uh, Safi Organics, organic fertilizer? And have you, what kind of challenges have you faced in communicating that message? But, um, so one, one of the things definitely has been, uh, our product has been relatively new, so if there was no such a product, and the fact that the product is coming from their own uh, West, what they know as West. So one of the things that we really did face is the challenge of adoption. So what we decided to do is actually do demo, demonstration plots within the farm. So we encourage the farmers to allow us to do a small demo for them, and through that, we also educate other farmers who come and visit the demos and see what is happening. So basically what uh, we have seen is once the farmers see that there is improvement in terms of performance, the farmers adopt the product completely, which gives us a very big uh, advantage as other farmers are also interested to see that this is working in his farm, why not try it in my own farm? So through that, we have been able to grow our customer base. Actually, growing our customer base has been a matter of advocacy and not any like really uh, marketing and that kind of thing. So it's just farmer telling other farmers what I'm doing, how I've improved my product, and through that, we have been in a position to get farmers adopt the new technology and adopt our product in, uh, for their own use. Yeah, thanks so much for those reflections. I, I'm sure Warren was probably nodding as you were emphasizing the role of demonstration, which is something that I know he, he's often really driving home in all of his trainings. Um, so thank you for highlighting that. I think that's definitely uh, rang true for us as well. 
And then Warren or Tom, I, I wanted to hand this question over to one of you. Um, we had the question raised about how agroecological approaches can balance more immediate short-term demands um, with the kind of longer term uh, trajectory that some of these uh, programs can take. So how do you get a farmer to invest and, and show some shorter term um, returns for programs that might take longer to see the full impact? So I'm curious if either of you have any thoughts on that. Maybe I'll, let me just, thank you, Kristen. Let me jump on the, the shorter end. Um, what we found, at least in some of these permagarden programs, is uh, the idea that, that implementing these practices, you can start having returns within weeks, literally. Uh, amaranth, uh, cow pea greens, which are eaten widely. Um, and you can start monetizing that, not, not in large yields, but what we like to, uh, we talk about is this 10% rule. How can within, say, household compound production, you through a number of combined practices, you increase this production by 10%. You extend the yield or the season by 10% there. And you have all these little 10% increases, but at the end of the day, you add them together. So that's, that's sort of how do you sort of increase production and in, in yield on the front end. And maybe let me hand it over to Warren about how this process can be thinking long, medium to long term. Yeah, the, in, in all of the systems, it's designing with the, the livelihood in mind of the people we're working with. So we're, we're looking at livelihood from both a nutrition and an income standpoint. And what are all the needs that they have throughout the year? So part of the success is looking at, you know, having a singular crop of like, let's say onions that ends up coming out at just one point with a harvest. And, and rather than doing that, we look at, well, what can we do in the interim while those onions are growing? Could we interstitially crop uh, greens that the, that the household could sell in the market on a weekly basis? So we, we start to look at niches within the system to, to build a more holistic view of their livelihood. As I know Fergus had mentioned, it, it's a whole systems approach. And so just looking at one crop and its impact is not enough information of how it's actually impacting a farmer or a community. And so I, I'm finding that people in the field are really excited to actually have perennials in their system as well. So edging their systems with perennials so that there's also long-term benefits where they can harvest for the, paying their school fees for their kids and looking at how that could all be integrated into an agro ecosystem, basically. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Tom and Warren. And sorry to speed us along, but I also um, had a question for, for you, Looney, and, and perhaps Amanda, you'd want to jump in as well. I just recognize that you both are in this unique space of, of having such a wide purview of a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses working in this restoration economy, agroecological space. And I'm curious from your reflections, um, both, you know, what advice do you have for, for other uh, businesses opening this space? Are there entering the space, are there certain key ingredients that you've seen that tend to be shared amongst those who are successful? Um, yeah, I'll turn it over to you, Looney. Yeah, uh, it's a totally unfair system. Uh, so yeah, we've seen um, you know, thousands of applications and the ones that tend to get picked by Fledge, right? And there's a slight distinction between uh, the way Fledge picks in the land accelerator, but not huge. Uh, the ones that we tend to pick are the ones that have shown uh, that customers want what they're selling. So all that, again, all this nicety is happening in the background and we, it, it's done because it's the correct way to grow. But ultimately, this product that's being sold, whether it's onions or, or something else, or, or mangoes or powdered mangoes, uh, ultimately, we need to see that customers want what's being sold or that the system is working, that the distribution system works uh, for whatever the products happen to be. Uh, and the, the way we see that is that we ask what your revenues are. So when Sam applied, he was asked, what are your revenues last year? And the other related question is, how much money has ever been put into this company? 
And so one of the key metrics that we're using is this ratio between money raised and last year's revenues. And most companies that apply, that ratio is a uh, smaller than one. So that means, you know, $10,000, $20,000 of friends and family or grants or, or personal money has been put into the company. And if it's in Africa, it's not uncommon for the revenues for the year to be, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars dollars uh, But a small number, about 10% of them, that ratio is one or higher. And to us, that looks more interesting. As investors, that piques our interest. And so this is why I say it's unfair because, you know, it's luck on who had the friends and family money or the grant uh, or, or just had some money that they were able to, to use to go build a company. Uh, and those that had that initial bit of luck then have the next bit of luck that they get invited into a program like ours. And then they get some help and then they get seen by investors and then they get more money and then they, they start to grow. Uh, and so there's a huge number out there that if only there was a little bit more uh, grant money, friends and family, or, or uh, wealth inequality fixed, that we would have more entrepreneurs doing more good deeds, uh, making more progress. And so at the moment, we're constrained. The reason I put up that, that cheeky little zeroth goal of funding the goals is that the UN didn't put a goal for, hey, we need, you know, $4 trillion in order to solve these problems uh, around the world. Right. And we do. We need trillions of dollars and we don't have trillions of dollars to solve it. We have maybe a few billion dollars to solve it. And I only have access to a few million of that. Um, and so the, the challenge out there is how do we leapfrog enough great, um, great ideas and great companies to a, a point where we can fund them? Yeah, thanks so much for those reflections, Lenny. I really appreciate that. And I see that we've run over time inevitably. So thank you all who stuck with us. I wanted to flag um, that, as I said in the beginning, we are really hoping that this conversation would carry forward beyond this webinar and that we can identify some collaboration opportunities. And so Anusha, if you could drop into the, to the chat box, we're dropping a link in here. That'll just give you an opportunity to say like, hey, I'm working on this issue. I'm you know, I have resources to share, or I'm interested in mentoring or partnering with an entrepreneur working in this area, or I am an entrepreneur interested in getting engaged in the Land Accelerator, or perhaps you're interested in, in sharing some research or looking for ways that you can help us build the evidence base. Uh, so we want to, um, we'll put that survey out and it'll give you an opportunity to sign yourself up, to tell us about your interests and and to see how we can move this uh, forward. Because I think the one thing that we've seen from this kind of multidisciplinary panel is that it really does take everyone at all levels to push this kind of transformation in our global food system. Um, so we wanna encourage you to all to get on board um, and we look forward to some exciting partnerships. Um, so with that, I'll conclude, we will share this recording We'll share a number of um, resources and links that might be of interest to you. And we look forward to staying in touch. So thank you again to all of our panelists. Thank you to, to our attendees. Um, I know it's really expanded my thinking in this space and I hope it's been useful for you all as well.